Hello and welcome to another bonus session for Save Your Sanity. And this live stream, I have with me a guest who has been on two episodes already of Save Your Sanity, Dr. Laura Dabney. Hi, Laura. Hi, Roberta. How are you? Oh, we're good. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. Dr. Dabney is a psychiatrist. She has all kinds of insights. You can go and listen to her episodes and uh, you can always find her uh, on her website. Where would you like people to go, Laura? RelationshipRx.com. It's actually Relationship-Rx.com. That has all my articles, videos, podcasts on there. Relationship.Rx. Relationship dash dash rx dot com. All right, so that's where you have to go. Relationship dash rx dot com. Learn a whole lot and find a whole lot when you go there about Dr. Laura Davney. So today we're talking about this big question that I get asked so frequently. Um, yeah. What should I do? I'm I'm in a relationship. I realize that the person has strong narcissistic tendencies. I don't want my children to emulate that. I know that they're seeing and hearing everything that's happening, even in the prenatal environment. What do I do? So we, how do I protect my child from picking up narcissistic fleas? How do I protect my child from modeling that, which is all they've seen before they even had language? How do I do that? So I think we can have a great conversation about this. And remember, everyone, you're welcome to put your questions. Just type them in. And uh, as appropriate, I will certainly address them. So, Laura, let's talk about brain development for a little bit so that people know what children are absorbing particularly or paying most attention to at, at particular ages and stages. Well, I mean, the brain is developing, of course, at a very rapid rate when children are small and um, so their brain development and their psychological development are sort of going hand in hand. And by psychological development, I mean the stages they're going through to learn to connect, communicate, monitor their feelings, right? So this is a process. Um, and you, a lot of parents can't get fooled by the fact that they're young or um, just because they don't aren't able to express or don't look like they're paying attention or um, aren't able to tell you what they're feeling. It doesn't mean they're not picking up on all these different patterns and cues and senses because they're not able to communicate. They're actually sensing more, a lot of studies show. So the tension in the household, um, unresolved issues are felt by them and um, they don't know how to process them. So it's fairly important to realize. And then as the, as the cognitive stages develop a lot of parents also overload so they think they're not doing anything and then sometimes they try to overload their child with too much information too early mm -hmm. so many parents want to parent you know right away as opposed to just at the beginning deflecting or uh, changing the topic or separating as opposed to waiting until their cognition middle school age is when the, the, the intellectual capacity is exploding and that's when you can start being a little bit more intellectual with them and explaining a little bit more and talking a little bit more, getting their viewpoint is so important. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are your options? What do you think? And all that through adolescence. Mm -hmm. So that's when you're helping with the emotions and the intellect. <laughs> right. Well, I often describe it as up until the age of six, seven, before we get parietal and prefrontal lobe development, that basically the children have to be thought of as a vibrating sack of emotional nerve endings who think they cause everything, right? So you have these little people, they don't even have any language and they're picking it up, folks. You have to know that they're observing. Haven't, haven't we all seen our children or other people's children learning to walk, for instance, and then they just stand there and all of a sudden you realize, wow, look, they stand just like their father or their mother. Well, there's the example. They have been watching, watching. Well, that's how you stand. Well, now they're learning other things like yelling and being afraid of yelling and looks on faces and scowls and smiles and the contrast between them. Because remember, 
children are not like horses and cows. They don't get spit out of their mother, licked off, and then they have the capacity to leap up and run around the meadow and find food. Right. They know that they can't do that. They know I'm a blob. I need those giants to survive. <laughs> So they're taking all that in to see, am I safe? Am I safe? Do they come when I call? Do they ignore me when I cried? What do they like? How do I get them to move me, to feed me, to take care of me? So important. Right. So middle school, yes, we can have all those conversations where they have some processing skills, but what about the little ones? What, when is it a time to realize that Okay, the effect is already happening. The modeling is already happening. Right. So there, so a couple things come to mind for me there. For one is you have to show them how to protect themselves in a physical way. So moving them out of the room, saying less but doing more, moving them out of the room, taking them away, saying it's going to be okay, comforting them, um, all these things to help them with the... The, the raw nerve endings that you're saying, but not overloading them with daddy's bad or mommy's doing something wrong or let me explain what's going on. It's just getting them that move. People underestimate how important just separating is to protecting oneself. Um, so the key is to do that, but also it's very important to understand that a lot of people get mixed up with the, my kid's a narcissist. Nar narcissism is, is a normal phase of development with narcissism. All kids go through a narcissistic phase, and that's normal. So again, not to panic because the child is showing these narcissistic traits that maybe you see in your spouse or somebody else in the family. It's not the same. <laughs> No, and and little children have to be the center of the universe, and they they realize that they are because, well, they think they are because they they are. I I I need your attention now. Right. I I have a need, and that's what we're talking about. The narcissistic thing is, well, oh, okay, I am just individuated from my mother, for example, maybe. Uh, 18 months old and I just finally realized that my mommy and I are not the same person <laughs> right it, and I can go and play over there and she can talk to somebody and I don't have to keep coming to check she's still there right. um, so these things are developmental for sure but when their child is in a constant environment where maybe a narcissistic parent is uh, demanding Maybe a narcissistic parent is neglectful. If the child is not happy, the narcissistic parent doesn't want anything to do with it. Or the child is unhappy and the narcissistic parent sees an opportunity to have real power over. Like one of the things I was saying on the podcast not long ago is, you know, how narcissistic is it when you have a child who is crying and a narcissistic parent comes and says, you stop that crying. If you're going to cry, I'll give you something to cry about. All right. Exactly. You want to be the author of my tears? Like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. exactly that's an excellent example. So these kinds of things, what, what do we have to observe in small children in their environment? How can we tell if our child is being negatively affected by our relationship? Yeah, any sudden changes in their behavior is always a clue. Never underestimate or brush it off as well as something going on at school or um, they'll get over it. S sudden um, despondency, pulling away, fears of going to school or the opposite of tremendous acting out. Pe people want to be, people want to be teachers. They want to be teachers of elementary school kids <laughs> because those kids are delightful. If kids in elementary school age years are fighting, kicking, biting, more than other children, that's a really alarm sign that something is going wrong. Or again, if they're backing up, shutting down, you know, those two extremes are huge warning signs that something's going on and needs attention. Yes, and, and it's really important, you know, that we see those red flags <laughs> because those children really need to, to be seen. They don't have mm -hmm. the language to say what's going on. They're responding. They're responding to their environment. They're responding to how they think they fit in their environment. And so you mentioned despondency, you know, a child who is just like, I don't care. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what I want. Um, 
they are withdrawn, they're, they're quiet, they're sleeping a little more, or a, a school-aged child who is beginning to pull away, you know, not caring if they go to events, not caring if they have friends, um, or spending a lot of time in their room doing solitary activities. Solitary activities are great. We want a balance of that. Uh, right. I spent 28 years in education, so I'm really, really uh, aware of these signs. In fact, I had a, a woman contact me on Facebook not long ago, and she's a grandmother and giving away things. And she said to me, oh, I can't believe I found you. She said, when, when I was in elementary school, you were the only person who saw what was happening to me, and you got me help. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really well, important for us to be aware of the signs and symptoms. So let's just talk about a few more of those as school-aged children and elementary school-aged children who should be in that delightful uh, figuring it all out stage. What mm -hmm. will we see besides despondency? Well, the key piece here that I just wanted to point out is that children who are despondent, or quieter or whatever get labeled as good and those who are acting out and acting out i guess in any kind of way physically verbally in the classroom get labeled as bad we go down this path of um, punishing or rewarding these behaviors again as opposed to wait a minute what's going on here why is this child more quiet or why is this child acting out asking the why i think our school systems are getting better at this maybe you were uh, ahead of this roberta but this whole why is opposed to just trying to solve the problem or just trying to quiet the problem or ignore the problem it's mm -hmm. huge yeah it, because children will withdraw mm -hmm. you know they and watch watch their body language you know they start to tilt their chin down and they look up at the world mm -hmm. they they regress they they sink in with their chest they you know get like this um <clears throat> there are lots of signs and symptoms when you ask them a question they're searching for the right answer that will make you happy as opposed to answering the question directly. Right. You know, that woman who contacted me, I remember her so well because she, she'd she come to school and you could tell she was afraid. You could tell she was sad. You could tell that that she was just uncertain of how she fit in the world. She just wasn't following the way that children who don't have an issue were. And, you know, we got Child Protective Services in and had that house looked at. Mm -hmm. um, so very important. How about littler children, children before they go to school? What can we notice? Well, similarly, you can see that in the household or their reaction to other children, such as friends, if you have them in a, in a, peer, in a little play group or to um, their siblings. But overly attached to um, objects or uh, people, even the mom, I mean, of course, they're very attached to the mom, but you start seeing this overattachment, you can't, you know, ever get away. There's no comfort in playing with another child or the delight in seeing a baby or something. Terrified of any kind of separation. Or they tend to glom on. Um, it is, again, so some, some ranges of normal here, but if teddy bears and those kind of objects, if they can't at all be separated from them, it might be something wrong. So either not connecting or again, back to the uh, over connecting on um, things. Again, this is, yes, there's a range. It's so simple though to say, well, they're just a little bit, um, they're just a little Maybe. bit different. Well, yeah, they're a little bit different than the other kids, but there's no harm in asking why. There's no harm in ex exploring this a little bit more. And what's happened in the environment? When did this start? Paying attention, it's like a science experiment, paying attention to when is this happening? Maybe even recording it in a journal so you can start getting some sense of what's contributing to this. Mm -hmm. And even with little children, you know, it's really good to teach them to be able to discern, are you feeling sad, mad, glad, or bad? Oh, you yeah. know, like get some language when you can right. help them identify their feelings. Of course, they're not going to be articulate and saying, I'm feeling particularly morose today, mommy. <laughs> uh, but they can say, mm, Start with the I'm sad, right? You know, <laughs> um, I don't feel like playing. I'm sad. Um, and help children have some expression. Now, what do you suggest that you the parent can do, a non 
hijack a parent can do when the hijack a parent is raging. What do you think we should do to mitigate that effect on the child? Yeah, again, similar to what you were saying, but I think getting them to a safe place um, reassuring them that you, you, you've got, you you want to show that you're in control. If you start acting out or raging back or doing anything like that, it, it's going to show the child out of control. You want to show a child, it's someone who's in control. You want to put a word on it that whatever parent daddy's mad, it'll be fine. It's normal to be mad. Just, you kind of want to normalize it a little bit. You know, it's not, but it's not a time to start telling your child he's a hijackal or got personality disorder or whatever. He's a narcissist. It's, it's just it's just to get that reassurance and to show them, teach them that leaving the scene when anybody's acting up is the safest thing to do. But you know, that's strange because I can almost hear people listening to this going, he will never let the child leave. Where do you think you're going? You know, I want power over you and I want power over you now. Nobody leaves. So what how, what do you do afterwards to mitigate, in your opinion? What do you say to the child after there's been a big blow up? Daddy or put his fist through the wall or mommy, mommy walked out or, you know, something happened. What do you what do you say to that child after they've had that happen when they're little? Yeah, I mean, same type of thing. This is not acceptable and this is what we're going to do from here on out. I'm in control. We've got it. Just a lot of reassuring words. If it depends what the child is doing. I mean, if the child is again sort of despondent and morose, you want to start putting words to that so they can start learning that we don't shutting down is not the only option. Again, it's not a horrible thing to do, but here are the words to use. And if they're acting up, I always like T. Barry Brazelton's, you know, that famous pediatrician's uh, that the putting them in a hug, I'm holding you until you can get control. So you're teaching them that control of themselves and putting words to things are normal. By proxy, you're saying that's not normal. This wasn't normal. Right. You keep demonstrating what's normal in yeah. whatever language they can hear at that point. You know, I've always thought about um, the Brazelton approach. It's a good start. But I prefer to tell the child, I'm going to hold you until you relax mm -hmm. because they don't, you know, control, like I'm not supposed to have these emotions. Well, maybe we should just relax and choose and know we're safe, you know, for little children, because if they relax and know they're safe, that I'm holding you and you're safe and you can relax, there is seeming more relief in that than saying until you can get control because it puts the problem on the child. What do you think well, about that? What I like about saying that you're in control is that you can have the emotion, but you can control yourself. A lot of my patients, when they get older, they're so afraid of saying they're angry, sad, or whatever, because they think it goes with an action. I'm like, emotion is not action. So I want them, I, I, I said, you can say you're angry and control yourself. You're a grown up. <laughs> you can do that. So I always try to give the message, you know, you, it's okay to be upset, but we need to control ourselves. You need to stop kicking. You need to stop flailing your arms, but relax. You, you, need, you need to relax. It's, it's perfectly fine too, but I'd like to put the control piece with the emotion. You can have high emotion. We can talk this through or you can express it, but the physical part's not acceptable. Okay, well, that's a good distinction. Like we can talk about anything. Let let me hold you until you find your words. Maybe yeah. that's a way that, like that, that we could express that. Mm -hmm. um, and then then you know that you can do something about it when you can find the words and identify what it is. Because I think that's really helpful to children. Um, we're beginning to get some questions here. Okay. So let's just see here. Um, <clears throat> Norma says, being held captive, not even being allowed to go to walk away to go to work happens all too often when the non hijackal parent tries to walk away. And yes, Norma, that's exactly what happens. Who, hey, you get back here. I'm not finished with you. I'm sure that's what Norma <laughs> is talking about. But right. that also happens to children is, you know, don't walk away when I'm speaking to you, that kind of thing. What do you, th what do you say to the child at that moment, how to process that? Yeah, and we're back to terms on the age and all that, but yeah, so sitting with the, what a response, a proper response, I, I'm, I need to leave because it's, I'm upset, I'll come back and finish this conversation with you. 
um, words, finding those words that can be more the range of normal and protecting themselves without upsetting the hijackal. But um, so walking, walking out on anybody is hard. So in reality, it's okay to start giving them some words to that they can phrases they can use to help them express what they're feeling and what they need without surprising or, or uh, the, the, the problem is you don't want to start getting an argument with the hijackal that you're going to lose. But by saying, I need to step away, the hijackal thinks they won because you now are, you're, you, you can't respond. So they're right. And so some phrase like, I need to step away. I need to, I'm upset. I need to process this or whatever the word is that's appropriate for the age. Yeah, I think that would be very difficult for children. I tell adults when I'm working with couples all the time about anger management, I give them the four-step process. First of all, identify, I'm getting really angry. Secondly, I don't want to ruin the relationship. Thirdly, so I'm going to walk away. And fourthly, here's when I'll be back. So we take, out, we take care of the abandonment issue. But children don't have that option because they're going to say, I want to go to my room now. No, you get back here. I'm not finished with you. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing we're going to hear from a hijackal parent is how dare you walk away with, from me when we're speaking. Right. Even if you gave voice to that, how dare you? You get back here. Um, so how do we help the child process that? Well, give them something to do with... Um, Letting the person, if the hijackal is not the type who's going to say, okay, once the once a child puts words to it, sometimes they are able to let them walk away. If they just walk away, then you didn't get permission. But in, in any event, if the, if the hijackal parent is not that type of parent, then you can give them the coping skills to um, listen without listening. I, I tell the children, I don't work with children a lot, by the way, it's not my specialty, but I tell children to put their hand on their ears so they're not listening to it, so it's not as loud to maybe recite something in their mind to calm them down so they can be present without taking it in. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell all my clients, whatever age they are, you got to learn to turn on the Teflon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, whoosh, just let it swish out. Okay, you know, there's all this stuff coming at me. It's not mine, it's theirs. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn on the Teflon. I'm going to appear engaged but I am not going to feel this coming at me. Or, think, or, or accept it as real or true. Or absorb it in any way. Yeah. Whoa, people have lots of questions today. So Liga says, um, oh, it's a long one. How to handle or explain to my daughter how come her dad could say how much they love their mother one day and next break up and on the third day have the new lover moving in? <laughs> You know, that's huge. And then she went on to say, yeah. I just can't wrap my mind around this to figure out how to explain this easy moving on behavior. I fear she could start thinking she could be replaced as easy as me. Good thought, Lika. Because on the surface, he was treating me similarly. I'm worried she will learn to twist herself in ways to please others. Well, there's your start right there. <laughs> Don't twist yourself to please others. <laughs> But letting them letting them know that again, you want to you want to take the normal part of it for them. It's not normal. You know, it's not normal. But it's too hard for a child to absorb that their parents not normal because, as you say, they know they depend on these people. So it, it's people people come and people go, and there's all kinds of things we don't understand. But um, the key point for you is to be able to control yourself, and you're safe with me, and I've got you. You just have to sort of um, put it in concept until they're older to talk about the abnormal parts of it. But it is normal for people to one day be happy and one day be sad or people come and people go in people's lives. And that does happen. And you want them to be able to accept the reality of that um, yeah, and then process what to do. Yeah, it's really hard because you have no control when you're little. You, right. know, you don't have right? control when you're older. You can't no, control someone coming and going. <laughs> No, that's absolutely true. I just want to tell everybody, if you want to find Dr. Laura Dabney, you find her at relationship. Uh, I'm going to do it again. Relationship-rx.com. Okay. Yes. So that's always uh, a resource for you. So you can learn more about Dr. Laura. 
And uh, if you want to find more about me, you'll find me at forrelationshiphelp.com. And uh, we can always talk. So uh, these are important things just to get out there and let everybody see. Let's go back to the comments here because I, w I think we have a few more things to say to Liga because, you know, that that how can adults change their minds so quickly and in such a feeling manner like I th yeah. thought daddy, you know, in this case, daddy, daddy left, but I thought daddy loved us and now he's got somebody else that he loves and it's only a few days. How do you explain that to a child? I don't think you can. I mean, I think you have to go back to the, you know, this is people come and people go and it's very sad. And what are your feelings about it? I feel sad. This is another thing I always, a lot of parents are afraid to show their emotions to children because they think it's going to be overwhelming. But it's so important to demonstrate your emotion and that you're in control of it and that it ends. So I'm sad, but it will pass. All feelings pass. Um, but it is sad that daddy left. We don't know the whole story about what's going on there. and we. But you and I can work this out together. We will be safe. We can move on from here and we'll have to accept daddy for what he is. So I don't think you can go into the whole, it's very tempting to go into the how damaged he is and the drama and try to make that child into a parental role you cannot do that the child can only absorb so much information and it's best to just sort of normalize the situation and then tell them the appropriate ways of that you're dealing with it and that they're dealing with it well you're bringing up a really good point because that whole thing of making your child into a confidant that's a similar age to you with the wow. language that you use is such a big mistake and it's a travesty for the child because exactly. the child has no hooks to hang that kind of emotion or experience on they don't know what to do and they feel like they should do something because they need you so they should do something to make you feel better and yeah. then you're parentifying the child and the child does not have that opportunity to be expressive at six years old or eight years old or 11 years old. Or to be and a the, kid. <laughs> no, the level of, of what they know about life, what they know about relationships, you know. Well, sometimes people just do things that just make us go, wow. And, <laughs> and I don't know, do you, you know, we just don't know why they do that. You know, I guess, I guess he thought that would make him happy. I guess he thought that that was the right thing to do. I don't know the answer, but we're good. You know, That's the other key to being able to say you don't know, yes. Mm -hmm. Because then you're not risking bad-mouthing the other parent, which is what we want to avoid. Right. Uh, we just simply want to, to stay with the child and their feelings at an age-appropriate level. You know, we don't talk about husbands and marriage and relationships and all to a six-year-old. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, they're, they're definitely there in their feelings. And, you know, daddy left me. You know, I've told the story before on my podcast about two little girls who I'd been working with a family. The family decided to separate. And the parents asked me to talk to the girls because I knew them well. And they were five and seven and I said to them, well, you know, why do you think daddy got a new house? And the five-year-old jumped in immediately and said, oh, it's, I know, I know, I know. It's because I left my bike behind his car. Oh. And the seven-year-old said, no, 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 no. Mommy and daddy were yelling at each other all the time, and they don't want to do that anymore. And that's where we see the difference in the brain development. Mm -hmm. The little one thought, I caused everything. I am the center of the universe, that narcissism that you mentioned. Right. And the seven-year-old is going, no, they're different than us. It, we didn't have anything to do with that mess. <laughs> right? Great. So it's important for us to recognize these differences in the mm -hmm. ages of children and what they can comprehend or what they should be asked to comprehend. Right. So very important. Let's just see here. We have so many folks here. Here's a good question from Ekaterina. What about Peter Pan syndrome when an adult guy is searching for a mother, not a woman? <laughs> um, well, that's certainly uh, modeling for children, I suppose. Right. But I don't think the children would actually perceive that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're asking about Peter Pan syndrome in general, 
well, that's um, that's a name given to men who don't want to grow up. They just want to, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it my way. I, I should be able to have it. And they're kind of stuck at five years old. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or in this case, what she's talking about is you, the, the, sometimes the person is over passive thinking that if I give, if I just do whatever mommy wants, I'll, I'll please her. Like I'll just keep doing everything to please her. Then it'll be a good relationship. But they're really checked out because they're not really coming to the table with what they're really feeling and thinking what they want to do. So it ends up being this lopsided, unhealthy relationship. Yes. So that that's a big important concern. Norma says, I have the same concerns. A hijackal claiming to want and love their family, yet neglecting and disrespecting them all the time. And yes, even going as far as replacing them and giving their attention or perceived love to others. Yeah. yeah. That's what they do. And that's what the child mm. perceives is, is that they don't know if there's enough love to go around. If mommy or daddy goes off and loves somebody else a whole bunch or seems to or is behaving in a way that a, the child recognizes as loving them, the child gets fearful. Will they stop loving me? Yeah. And, you know, I think Norma's place, uh, words are, are right, that will I be replaced in the spectrum of love? Will there be enough love to go around? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think you have to, again, reassure the child that you don't have the answers. You don't know how long daddy's going to be around or not around, but you do everything you can to make it work. And you certainly, uh, you, I will be here. I will love you forever. So you have to admit your sh your shortcomings, admit you don't know everything. And we don't. I mean, dad could die tomorrow. And it's not just hijackles. So sometimes right. you have to be, yeah. give them a little bit of the reality or, um, and but just reassuring them that this is normal and we can get through it, giving them the tools to work through that pain of loss. It's like parents mm -hmm. who, who die and you don't want to lie about it, but you don't want to overload them with the information either. Yeah. And again, it comes down to really understanding the differences in ages and what children can comprehend yeah. and what they should be fed as opposed to what you might want to overfeed them with. Right. Good point. Yes. Yeah. Because you're, you have a bunch of emotion. And so you may answer the question in a, an adult way and the child can't comprehend it. And when you do that, then the child can become fearful that you, you need taken care of too. Right. And we don't want the child to feel overburdened in that way either. It's a big deal, it's... a really big deal. So uh, there's a couple more questions, and then I'd like to ask, uh, bring up a couple of topics. Norma said, I'm pretty sure that my son developed OCD due to our unstable, volatile household. His teachers have pulled me to the side to address his OCD behavior at school as early as kindergarten. Well, if you can't control the emotions and all the stuff that's going on in the house, you're likely to go find something you can control. And then that too can get out of control. Right, Laura? That's right. Exactly. Yep. Where can you have control? Where do you don't have control? Um, having a child understand exactly where their limits are and what they're responsible for. But it all starts with, Roberta, what you said. You have to be always in charge. Um, I talk about being on a ship, a cruise ship. And if the captain is saying, oh my gosh, there's a iceberg over there. And oh my gosh, there's land there. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, if they're, you just, you don't want to hear it. You just want to know the captain is in charge. That's what children want. They get anxious when they think somebody isn't in charge or in control. So that's what you have to be demonstrating to give them that um, stability since you don't have anybody else to rely on to give that st stability if you're with a hijackal. Yeah, I think, too, we should jump on the discernment there between it is not a lack of control to say, I don't know. Right. Right. Because those two things get married right. sometimes. So right. Right. You know, if I say, I don't know, but, you know, I'm going to jump in here with you. And, yeah, we both have those feelings. That mm -hmm. also normalizes the feelings for the child. Like, right. I don't know why why he does that in that instance we were talking. Earlier. I don't know why daddy left and found a new partner two days from when he left us, but it doesn't feel good, does it? Let me jump into the feeling with you mm. and we can talk about that. That's a really important thing to do mm -hmm. um, because, you know, this OCD question, going back to Norma's question, mm -hmm. when a child is searching for how do I control my environment? 
when when all of the giants seem out of control when none of none of the things that i thought were there i will start you know making all kinds of things getting super tidy or trying to um, control the pet or thinking that magical thinking that you know if i only take three steps before i leave the stop sign then daddy will come home you know, things that that look for that level of control. So it's I think also, you're right, Norma. It's also a way to bury emotions. You know, you, your brain can't be intellectual and feeling at the same time. If you've ever been overwhelmed with a sudden loss or feeling, you realize your, your, your brain gets a little fuzzy. Um, and same thing with the, your intellectual, it's harder to have the feelings. So OCD is a good clue that there's some feeling there the child isn't accepting or acknowledging or wanting to feel, so. That's really important. I'm just going to reiterate what Laura said because it's so important. The brain is binary. It can't be in two places at once, much as people want to think they're <laughs> multitasking. Uh, it's still yeah. a zero and one situation. So it's in logic, it's in feelings. It's in logic, it's in feelings, but it's not logic and feelings. Right. Exactly. So very important. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of things and get it out here. How do you decide when to leave? Is there a developmental time that is better if I have choice, you know, if there's kind of a standard of hijackal behavior going on and I could choose when to leave? How do I know when to leave? The older the child, we mean in terms of the age of the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the older the child, the better. The more they can, the more they're stable or have the cognitive and the emotional development, the more will be able to handle that loss especially if you're leaving a hijackle, because if you're leaving a hijackle, it's probably not going to go that smoothly. Um, <laughs> and neither is the new family situation. So you, you want the child to be as developed as possible in order to be able to absorb these things as best as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. And if you know you're with a hijackle, prevent pregnancy <laughs> or leave while pregnant do not bring the child into it if you can right. avoid it, particularly if there's violence involved or is close to violence or threatened violence. Don't right. do it. Just don't bring the child into that energetic environment. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we have the distinction because children have kind of an individuation somewhere 18 to 24 months. and. Um, that's a time that's so important for the children. So please don't be leaving that. <laughs> they, they've got some things they have to go through and, and there are some trigger places there. So, you know, if you want to work with Dr. Laura, you know where to find her. Um, and if you want to work with me, you know where to find me, but I'll remind you of all these things. Here's Dr. Laura. You can find her and ask her those questions and uh, you can find me here and ask me questions too if these things are triggering you and you know you'd like some more advice so um <clears throat> i think that the more cognitive functioning a child has the more they can see that the separation or the leaving is separate from who they are right and that's what we want because when they're little they think that that those two things are the same they're leaving me yeah, they don't like me no, there are a whole lot of things in the world that once your parietal and prefrontal lobes get developed, you realize that, oh, they're having a whole world that has nothing to do with you. Right. And that's a really tough one. <clears throat> All right. So we're getting some strong questions here. And my son will be 19 years old soon and seems very well adjusted now and is already becoming successful in adulthood. But I'm worried that my 10 year old daughter is not doing well as well as my son did growing up. With my son moving out of the home, I think it's extra emotional overload for her. It is emotional for me as well as depending. Is depending on a child therapist better than trying to address issues on my own? What do you think, Laura? That's an excellent point. It's not necessarily better, but it's certainly why not have a partner in helping you and your child cope with this? I think it's an excellent idea whenever you think of bringing in somebody else to support the child, especially if they're losing a hijackal parent. Uh, so that's an excellent point. Yeah, I think having safe adults um, that are outside of your emotions 
is a good thing for the child. The child can go and talking about it as though it's a painting over there as opposed to talking with somebody who's in the boat with them. Like, yeah. we're going to go to land over there, and you, we, you and I, I can tell you where the land is, but when you're both in the lifeboat going, are we going to get to land? <laughs> it's a little <laughs> bit harder. So I think it's a very good question. And yes, um, give the child another adult to talk to that they can trust, right. uh, one that is not emotionally involved. That's a very good question. And someone on Facebook just asked this question, and I'm so glad you are. I'm starting to go through a divorce with a verbally and mentally abusive alcoholic and so worried about my children. My 15-year-old mm. son is so conflicted. Mm. I'm assuming you are female. <laughs> he has <laughs> taken care of dad for a while and is normalizing his dad's actions. Also, mom is so uptight and everyone drinks. How do I help him realize it's not normal without sounding like I'm preaching? Oh, now I don't know who you are. <laughs> right. I'm a little confused too, but... Yeah, you're, you're, you're going through a divorce. Uh, maybe you have two dads. My 15-year-old son is so conflicted. He's taken care of dad for a while and is normalizing his dad. And mom is so uptight and everyone drinks. How do I help him realize it's not normal without sounding like I'm preaching? Well, I think we need some clarity about this question. Um, going through a divorce with a mentally and abusive alcoholic person is no picnic at any time, children or not, uh, because you're going to have a lot of blame and he may very well have a lot of rage and at the same time also be having depressive behaviors. So it can be a real salad or uh, a real problem but then you have a 15 year old who is looking to a male model someone to whom he may or may not be bonded and of course he's having difficulty this is a very trying time so I think I'm, I'm wondering if she's saying that the uh the ex is saying that he drinks all the time and because the the person writing in mom is so difficult that's why he drinks uh his mom is make mom makes everybody drink so uh, the son is probably you have to keep in mind that the son is probably normalizing because he's afraid of losing the father right so he's got to he doesn't want to see the negative feelings towards the father he's afraid he's going to lose him so he's going to uh, accept the, this viewpoint the key piece for you is not to try to change that, but just to keep a really good relationship with him so he can start seeing as he gets older what is normal and what is not. Tr trying to change him is me too anxiety provoking or trying to change his mind. Let him have his viewpoints. Just don't engage with that, but ha continue to have a good relationship with him, showing what a non alcoholic <laughs> parent uh, relationship looks like. And you know, yes. he'll start seeing that on his own. Yeah. Yes, and a non verbally. Uh, abusive, abusive relationship right. 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 yeah so so getting yourself in check um being the model you want your child to see being a model of how you want your child to think that this can be handled even though it's tough you can break down when they go to sleep but right. you know be the model when you're with them um and and again don't try to be super person um right. because we're not <laughs> and don't yeah, be upset it, that they have a different viewpoint of the ex than you do. It's okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean they love him more. A lot of parents make the mistake of, well, if I'm angry, you should be angry. And if you're not, then you're not on my side and all that nonsense. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. It. And it's really not about taking sides. It's really, really not about taking sides. It's about jumping into the feelings and sitting with them, with them, right. to normalize the feelings and to allow them to have and express the feelings. And then, you know, you don't have to have an answer. You just have to say, ah, oh, that sounds really hard. Yeah, I get that. I feel like that sometimes too. When I feel like that, I try to remember that other people's behavior is not my choice. It's theirs. Right. You know, being able to reflect back like that can be helpful. I'm sorry that we, we don't have clear information because we're a little unclear about your question. <laughs> Hopefully that gave something. Yeah. Norma says, my family always urges more children and doesn't understand why I'm against having more, nor do I want to explain every dirty detail to them. Well, 
that's a big one whether you're with a hijackal or not people some families will put pressure on you to have more children and the answer i think is uh we have the number of children that we feel is good for us right. and then don't make it a debate it isn't a debate you've decided you've given them an answer their expectations have nothing to do with the equation right. just because you think i should have more children doesn't mean that i should just because you think i should jump in the lake doesn't mean i should you know right exactly so don't get all emotional about it get really clear neutral genuine and honest and just say no that's a decision between my partner and i and we've decided not to have more children yeah or even say i take that as a compliment you must really like my children oh there you go yeah i'm but, glad that you see me as such a capable parent but i have all the children i i can handle and give right. my love to right <laughs> all right great so liga says that's exactly why i'm concerned my kid is eight years old and I see that she strives to be the one who solves everything. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to show her that it's not her role or responsibility. Any suggestions how to ensure that's not her role? Okay, well, we may have overlapped in what we were just saying. What would you right. say, Laura? Well, you know, you got. I would look into why she thinks that. I wonder if you're giving some subtle cues that she does need to be in control. I'm, I, I would explore that a little bit more. Uh, take a look at what she's doing exactly and what exactly are you saying or doing that may be um, unconsciously probably uh, supporting that or giving her that idea. But that said, I, just if you're if you're explaining to her, I've got that. That's my role, not yours. Your job is to play and be a kid. My job is yes. be in charge of the sibling <laughs> or the yeah. situation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's beautifully said. I hope that helps you because you know, when you assure your child, I got this, even if you don't think you got it, right? If you assure your child that I got this, this is adult stuff. You don't have to worry about that part. I, mm -hmm. I got it. I'll deal with it. You go play, you have fun, you, you know, and you can always talk to me about how you're feeling. The child mm -hmm. wants to know you're there and you will take the burden and they just want to know you've got it, that they don't have to. So it's a really good question, Liga. Eight-year-old should not be trying to solve adult problems, not be trying to solve everybody's problems. They should be playing and exploring and creating and enjoying. And when they have to go through something difficult, you don't want to spend too much time in the, in the realm of uh, discussing these things even you know be present be a sounding board allow the child to talk but don't don't um, think allow the child to think that they should come up with a solution it just isn't so right. all right so Chris says my boyfriend is a narcissist okay good start you're <laughs> not in a full-time relationship with him um, he blames me for everything Oh, you are. My 14-year-old daughter and I had a really close relationship her whole life. Now he has turned her against me and she says I make her nervous. She now pushes me away. Um, is it safe to assume, Chris, that the your boyfriend is the father of this child? Or is your boyfriend trying to intervene and take the place of your child? Mm. Maybe you could give us a little information about that. Because when you have a 14-year-old daughter, that may be a situation that a narcissistic boyfriend who enters a home that already has a 14 year old daughter is going to do everything to take first place because mm -hmm. always remember hijackals must win in every situation mm -hmm. whether that's a conversation or a lifetime so if that's what's going on you know you've got to have some strong boundaries about my child was here first you know I actually divorced because I was in a second marriage and my husband at that time told my then 12 year old daughter that she could move out and leave because he didn't like her. And I said, oh no, you have that all wrong. You are the last one into the family, you leave. Right. <laughs> um, he did which was great <laughs> really great but if if that's what's happening if there's a power struggle between the narcissistic boyfriend 
and and he wants to take over and be the apple of your eye and the center of your attention from a child a 14 year old who needs you you know, again big red flag no 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 what do you say laura obviously i've got energy around that one <laughs> well i'm with you um i really have to ask yourself why you're in this relationship uh, with somebody and threatening your 14 year old's place uh, you're in charge of taking care of her and part of that is not engaging with people who are like this um it's a very toxic relationship by being in it you're demonstrating to her that somehow this is okay but you're also um again you're you're upsetting the uh, apple cart here where you're even allowing someone into the house to even try to take the even to take the place of, or even try to take the place of. It's not fair or right for that 14 year old. So. No, and, and also think about the level of involvement of that boyfriend. He is working out at a level that's less than 14 years old in developmental age. Right. <laughs> you know, like, do you really need another child? Yeah. I think maybe he ought to be deep sixed and focus on the 14 year old and I know I can't say that to you because I don't know your situation but you know oh yes he is the father oh okay now we have some clarity well and the same thing applies he still wants to be number one on the planet right <laughs> and so the 14 year old is maybe going through some struggles maybe some power struggles maybe not liking him much maybe questioning him maybe questioning the way he treats her or his ideas or whatever might be going on and he has to see that as normal we want that we want the child to be questioning reality questioning their place in the world and we want them to feel safe to do that so if if you could appeal to the vanity of the narcissistic father that we must be doing something right because she is growing into this situation that might be an avenue in mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that that's a very difficult one if she is her father if he is her father then is this new behavior really or is it that the 14 year old is is reacting to what she's seen all the time and now she's not liking him as much as she did before and he doesn't like that well it's also entering the stage of where she's separating so she's getting her own mind her own thing that threat to the jackal to the boyfriend so yeah probably responding to that too mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. norma says hijackals can be jealous of love given to children even their own children oh yes you know <laughs> i say all the time I think it is my opinion entirely, but I've been doing this with these wonderful folks for a very long time. I mm -hmm. think hijackals have children for three reasons. One, to have someone to agree with them. Two, to have someone to serve their purposes. And three, to have someone they believe will give them validation and adoration for a lifetime and make them look good. Uh, if any of those three things aren't happening, the wheels are going to fall off. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. They see them as extensions of themselves is what is sort of in a nutshell. But these these children are not their separate beings. They're not there to have their own identity and their own ideas, their own beliefs. They're there to make you look good. <laughs> yeah. Like I will pull the strings. I will be the master manipulator. I'll tell you how you feel. That's where the whole idea of gaslighting comes from. Right. You know, I will tell you. If, if anybody ever says, even a parent says to their child, I know you better than you know yourself, just have the flashing neon sign, gaslighting. You know? right. So that sounds like something he's up to. And you may have to do a turnaround like that. If you want to talk to me about that, go to beaclient.com. We can talk about that and I can learn your situation a little more. Or you can go to relationship-rx.com and uh, connect with Dr. Laura. So, uh, oh, it looks like this could go on for a long time. Um, but Liga says, I recognize that behavior in our house as well. And Chris says, yes, he's the father and says, I'm controlling. Well, of course they do, because I did a whole episode on that when this is blame shifting. If you say you should never tell a narcissist that you think they're a narcissist anyway, in my right. opinion. It's not the, it'll go nowhere. No. Well, it will go somewhere. It'll blame shift and come right back at you. <laughs> it's like a boomerang. So, yeah. So there's really no point in doing that. But um, 
it's, it's really important for us to have that opportunity to see, okay, let's just put it over there and step back and have a look at what these dynamics really are. Because when we're in it and our feelings are all engaged, that's why we need help. That's the answer to the earlier question about having a therapist for yourself right. or having a therapist for your child is so that you can be in it and someone else can hold the space for it. Right, Laura? Right. Absolutely. I mean, you just can't help to have more eyes on the problem when you're in it. Again, when you're an emotional problem. So one of our people say, how do you know that? But it, one of the biggest advantages Roberta and I have is that we're outside. So we don't have the emotional piece so we can see a little bit more more intellectually and um, logically what's going on. And we can share that with you. It's very hard to do that when you're in the weeds for any of us. Oh, really, really hard. And, you know, that's the answer to why, why do therapists exist? I mean, certainly yeah. Dr. Laura is a psychiatrist, so she has a whole lot of other tools in her toolbox that she can offer beyond what I can offer. But <clears throat> it's really important to have people who will hold the space for you to have your feelings and to help you walk through that while you don't have to then be doing that and being expressive or and being logical and all of those things. Right. That's the whole point. And that's why your friends can't do it for you. Right. They right. can help, but they don't have the framework to hold it for you. Mm -hmm. So great, Chris, she says she'll be calling. Norma says, yes, completely correct. And if the children are not, quote unquote, like them, don't play sports like them or do this or that like them, they're not interested in their interests, they show any kind of individuality, then the hijackals are going to get angry. Well, yes, because they are so super sensitive to shame that if you are not like me, why not? Am I not worth emulating? Right. Ugh. Are not good oh. enough for you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, such nasty mm -hmm. stuff. Such nasty stuff. Um, so thank you all for uh, giving us your questions and giving us an opportunity to respond to that. Um, do you think, Laura, in closing here, is there any best practice or rule of thumb for knowing when you need to get your children away from a narcissistic or hijackal parent? Trust yourself. You know, so many people get wrapped up with hijackals in the first place because they somehow don't trust their instincts, don't trust their, what they can do. They're not listening to these red flags, these uh, emotions, uh, anger. Um, if you're getting angry a lot or need neediness isn't being fulfilled, take a look, trust that, take a look and see what's going on, test the red flag, put it out there. If they respond badly, go ahead and get out. I mean, if if it's a danger in any way, shape or form, it's incumbent upon you to get that child to safety. If it's something you can tolerate, if they're okay some of the time, then it's better to have the child in it as long as possible to, for their development to be as far ahead as possible when you, when you leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a careful calibration about mm -hmm. emotional and physical safety, sexual safety as well. Right. You have to be watching all the time. And yes, it's too bad that you have to be the one who's watching. You have to be the adult in the relationship. Oh. But you do. You yeah. really do. Reality. And get support for yourself. Talk to Dr. Laura. Talk to me. Um, so really important. And once again, Laura, here I am looking for your URL. Um, <laughs> it's really, really great to talk to you about these topics. I hope that we continue to do this every couple of months so that people sure. get a new insight and they can uh, explore something. So go and find Dr. Laura Dabney at relationship dash rx dot com sounds like morse code <laughs> <laughs> and and read her blog read all the things that she has there all of the insights that she has and of course you can always find me at for relationship help that's also the name of my youtube channel there's 550 plus videos over there that you can sift and sort and search so uh, if you're thinking about a particular topic you will find that there so thank you so much for being my guest, Laura. It's been oh. another great conversation. Thank you for having me. We've always had such a wonderful time talking about this topic. So I'll be <laughs> glad to come back anytime. 
great. Well, we'll do it again soon. And if you're listening and you have a topic we'd like to, you'd like us to discuss, put it into the Facebook or the YouTube, wherever you're watching this Facebook Live. And Dr. Laura Dabney and I will discuss it because we want to answer your questions. So until we speak again, you've got the URLs on the screen. Go and find Dr. Laura at relationship-rx.com. Find me at forrelationshiphelp.com. And in the meantime, treat yourself very, very well because you're precious and you matter. Take care.